Yeah. Okay, thanks so much for um, the second last talk actually of this, of this term. Um, it's been a quite interesting, uh, exciting term. Um, today, I, I, um, today actually, I should probably have to mention actually that the idea was actually to have Habiba, Habiba Badrun here, famous uh, South African poet and author, and unfortunately... Instead you got me. Instead we got me. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. Not only instead, we have the, uh, the followers or the, the tradition of Habiba continuing here. So, um, the pa 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 oh, unfortunately what happened was she was not well, so she was unable to come. Um, and the idea actually was to have her read some of her poetry, because also think about how the poets and literature also tell us something about the South African, about the condition, about the human condition, which can give insights into anthropology. Um, and to have Nadia, Nadia Sassana from English, and Rian, as people who are familiar with her work and are familiar with the terrain of South African literature, to give us some kind of you know, insights and commentary on it. So unfortunately, we don't have Habiba here. And, and then Rian stepped, stepped up and he said, well, he actually has an idea of how to really think about theorizing Habiba in the context of South Africa. Um, so that's what we have today. But I thought I should probably just tell you for two minutes about why she's so interesting. And this was a book that I just read yesterday regarding Muslims. Um, and regarding Muslims, I read it way too late, but I'm absolutely blown away. I think this, we, we, we've been discussing what is this connection right, between literary theory, literature, literary production, and what anthropology can do and can say. And, and I think this book regarding Muslims is probably the prime example. Like it brings a very careful work of history, of critical theory, critical feminist scholarship, both to look at the historical view of how Malay, Muslim, colored identity has been constructed, produced over, over time, but also how through a focus on food and kind of embodied memories, right, of how history is actually sedimented in the present. There are different ways of approaching history. There are different perspectives from which people come. And um, yeah, and, 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 and so she, she gives us a very, um, a very complex view right, of how to understand the present um, and how to account also for the complexity of history, right, of empire, both as a kind of a very powerful force that clearly had, um, you know, had um, t terrible consequences, but also in which intimacies, which, which also contains uh, histories of exchange and intimacy. And I think the important, amazing thing about her work is that the complexity of exchange, of intimacy, of contact is not somehow used to say that, well, actually, therefore, colonialism was fine, but actually it's a way of creating more complexity about the way that power operates and the way that, um, yeah, that, that we end where we are. Um, and I think definitely reading this book, we can see continuities, right, in the way that she sees apartheid not as a... Uh, a radical new juncture, but as a kind of a new moment, uh, which has historical continuities, which, 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 which basically transforms the space. Um, for anthropology, I should also mention, because sometimes it obscures, I'm working in materiality and the study of materiality, you can also see the way in which food, right, as a locus of history and memory, becomes a place where, um, where we can think about, yeah, embodied and everyday, everyday ways in which people live the past in the present. Um, yeah, I don't have to say more, I think Rian is going to give us a much more uh, comprehensive view. So Rian is from a, a lecturer in English. Um, he is, um, he just told me now, he read an unpublished version of this book. He's also uh, referenced very favorably as someone who has actually looked at Malay food as somehow uniquely South African in the way that it was forged in the context of empire and power and uh, yeah, intimacy and intimacy and power. Um, yeah, uh, hand over to you and then hopefully at some point Nadia will Hopefully. <laughs> Some contributions. We'll try to continue the idea of the conversation. Let's see. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shahid. Uh, thank you, everyone, for being here. Uh, Nadia and I are both very happy to be here. I'll, I'll, I'll speak for her for now. And uh, it's also very pleasant to see members of our own department here. Bless you. Uh, I was going to say a few things about this amazing book Shahid had been sharing with you, but that also would be a little bit unfair because as he pointed out, I, I had some insider knowledge that book, it, it, it greatly helped my uh, early writing out, and just this fascinating idea of, of tracing intimacies through food and uh, what, what Khabibur describes as fusion food, how we can really understand so much of ourselves. Uh, just through what we eat and how historically grounded that is. That is definitely such an important form of intimacy to look at from, from the writer of the 2018 poetry collection, The History of Intimacy. And intimacy is something I want to focus on, but I want to pull it back to something that's just there and easy for us to see, just 
the simplest intimacy we can think of how we relate to someone else and in Habiba how a poet conveys that sense of intimacy and then through different collections of, of work conveys a sense of, of intimacy through history and history as framed by intimacy. I hope to, to get there. What you see here in the PowerPoint is what I'll get to in the middle of this presentation. There are a few stages I'm taking us through and there has to be the disclaimer in that I, at the moment I feel I'm, I'm, I'm just hungry to write in anything. That's because I really owe my department some publications. It's been a while. <laughs> So what I've been doing is I've just been looking at anything that looks fertile and it, it's, it's worked out well so far. I'm really interested in this topic of post-truth and we've heard some speakers on that. And I'm currently writing on Cape gang violence, um, you know, very serious uh, topic and also very close to some of us. I am a great admirer of Habiba and I'll mention the other two poets as well. But I never dared to try and write about her work. Also, after 14 years as a lecture, lecturer of English, uh, poetry is just my weakest area. I look at my, my colleague, Lizelle, sitting here, and she is fabulous with it. I look at my boss, Sally Ann. She has a poetry collection coming out very soon, by the way. Uh, we should congratulate her for that very quickly. <laughs> but one must be challenged. So you're finding me reaching. I had a number of ideas of how I might try this and source ideas from colleagues in different departments, anything that helps uh, to write. So I'll run a few things by you, but let's start proper. So the poetry collections of Khabiba Badaruns, Nisoka Suku Matisa, and Kenya Davids offer narratives of familial observation in different stages of recent South African history. Each poet suggests the study of family and family structures contemporaneous with contemporaneous <laughs> with specific moments in the country's social, political, and social cultural timeline. There are thematic intersections between the works of the three poets, especially with life writing and autobiographical narratives each poet draws on from different generational viewpoints. In this presentation, the convergences of the poetry collections present a framework of observations prioritizing intimacy as a social study. That was in my head about a month ago. Some things have changed today, and this is part of the experimental nature. So why these choices? Now, this is awkward, but should I say that the three poets happen to be women? Does that matter? The w word for win? It could either mean plenty or mean very little, and both could be right. It feels that if I do first talk about the poets as women, which I seem to be doing anyway, I'd run counter to what I claim at least two of the three poets seem to be doing in their work, avoiding certain ideas of belonging and identity and leaving gendered and race-based readings up to you, the reader. Ah, intersections. I should, however, provide a starting point. In December 2018, I had heard about a young poet who had just published her first collection. So young, in fact, that she had the millennial temerity to do so at the age of 20. Where were you? Where was I at 20? Well, I was living in Paul at the time, my hometown, which incidentally is where Kenya Davids is from, the 20-year-old. So, home team logic dictated that I find a copy of her collection, Rebirth, and read it. Typically, it was not available anywhere in Paul. English poetry in Paul? Good luck. And I found it in Cape Town, where I live. Funnily enough, I was back in Paul when I read the collection. It took me all of the length of time to drink a fruit shake at Spur in the Paul Mall to finish it and feel excited. Wow. A 20-year-old whose poems weren't painful to read. <laughs> I also noticed that the book's cover was faded yellow. And let's see if I can just show you that. This is Kenya's book. If you promise to leave my bookmark intact, I will ask Shade to <laughs> just spread the book around. It reminded me of two other yellow poetry collections, Loud and Yellow Laughter by Cindy Busuku Matisse and The History of Intimacy by Habiba Badarun. I'd read both early in 2018 and I knew both poets. The idea came to me that it would be great if Kenya, Cindy, and Habiba could meet. Kenya, the young arrival, Cindy, the recent prize winner, and Khabiba, the established voice. Just a meeting between them, nothing fanciful, maybe something easy like the yellow wallpaper poetry plenary of postcolonial parasitals. <laughs> Perhaps not, even as I was too lazy to follow up on a title like that, even me. Also, I couldn't quite make the yellow wallpaper angle stick much as I love that classic story. But the three poets being connected felt important. Khabiba and Cindy already knew one another, and Cindy had been the interlocutor at Khabiba's recent Cape Town launch of History of Intimacy. Kenya needed in on that, I decided how patriarchal of me. 
Just before leaving for the US ahead of Christmas, I sent Kenya a message on Facebook, congratulating her and asking her permission to give my copy of the book to Habiba, whom I'd hope to see while in the States, where she resides. With Kenya's permission, I posted my copy to Habiba from Connecticut, where I was at the time. Habiba and I could not meet, so the postal service was the best option. Knowing that Habiba had a health concern, and we are still concerned about that as we speak, I hoped she could travel to South Africa, but I wasn't betting on it. Also, Cindy was back in uh, KZN. I dropped the idea of arranging a meeting and pretty much dropped my excitement to write something, anything, about the three poets with the yellow books. To my surprise, just as I was moving on with other matters in January, Shade wrote to me and told me about this seminar. Habiba was slated to be here, but her health concern put the matter up in the air. Would I be able to fill in and write something about her work and social theory? Well, yes to Habiba, but no to social theory, and Shahid understood that. I also suggested Nadia to Shahid, although I think he was already considering her. And for a while, it shaped up to be Nadia, myself, and Habiba, after all, but finally, the great poet took her doctor's advice and stayed in the States. We wish her well. And now, you have me, rambling incoherently. Consider that against Habiba's calm, soothing voice. <laughs> Until Nadia puts me out of my misery later, I will turn to my exceptional senior colleague for help throughout. Lastly, I met Kenya for the first time this past weekend. Of all places, it was at the Paul Mall, where I stood in line at Sweets for Heaven with my godson. I recognized her, introduced myself, and mentioned that I was going to do this. She asked me when and where, and I lied immediately. I'm nervous enough as it is in front of my peers, but in front of one of the poets discussing their work? Not yet. A millennial poet at that. I will, however, send her any decent paper after this, after your comments, if something does come of this. That much I did promise her. At the moment, I apologize. This is me thinking out loud, considering and wondering where and how I can ultimately frame the study of these three poets. Now, in keeping with a device that Cindy used in her collection, she used a theatrical device. She actually had stage settings and characters introduced as if they were in a stage play. Here are our characters or our poets. Khabiba, professor extraordinaire with us, yes, English department, and someone just about everyone wants to be around. A generous person, community-minded, often at public events, she'll read the work of other poets like Cindy Kuleka Patuma. Now that is, that is an endorsement. Cindy, arguably the poet of the now, more than deserving Ingrid Jonker Prize winner for her incredibly sophisticated and original collection, and she's doing her PhD with us. Yes. Uh, and Kenya, how does a 20-year-old make an academic almost twice her age feel lacking in accomplishment? A vibrant, positive new voice we want to hear more of. So these are the poets, and this is the way I'm trying to frame them. Now. I'm grouping this in what I call family and intimacy versus apartheid and post-apartheid identity politics. People versus the people. We are at a high point, I think, of what we might call 21st century identity politics and ways we may differentiate autobiography from writing the self. Books by younger authors, it seems to me, have much life writing in, in them, whereas earlier, perhaps we expected these mostly from older authors with apartheid-era stories to tell. We may have been mistaken once to think, if we did, that younger writers did not have post-apartheid stories to tell, even if post-apartheid is only celebrating its quarter century this year. In the year 2000, English studies lecturer and cultural studies theorist Sarah Nuttall argued for changing focus areas in English cultural studies and on a larger scale, African literature itself. Nuttall called for the detaching of academic study of local texts from identity politics because to her, that was limiting and prone to overlooking the microcultural complexities between South African people uh, across racial and cultural lines. Her argument was for a broader, more positive approach that studied aspects of daily South African life, not always bound by a part of that era identity categorization. With her and others calling this transnational formation, the assistance was, in effect, uh, on countries' cultures from the constraints of the past and helped reconstitu reconstitute public intellectual space. I mention this because two of the poets I discussed today are scholars. Nuttall eventually gave us entanglement as a th synthesis in later years. Drawing on the term as sparingly used by others, Nuttall offered readings of literature, art, and media, showing entanglements of the now and possibilities for the future. Her argument remained consistent, to take literature and cultural studies away from political and racial determinism, to look at matters of identity and self-styling, but not to privilege identity politics, per se. Nettle's work between 2000 and 2009, a specific overview of discussions around cultural studies was articulated. 
She claimed that arguments in favor of cultural studies allowed for mobility between disciplines and enable diverse approaches to cultural texts that could be applied outside of academic institutions, venturing into readings of public spaces. Nuttall called her own interests politics of the emergent, an emphasis on possibility rather than a retreading of apartheid-era definitions. She also called for the recognition of several involved relationships of intimacy and exchange between people, again, as opposed to the people, that had always linked most of Africans across racial and cultural lines, and in all likelihood, relationships forged exactly through strife and structural segregation. Not enough of these relationships were discussed outside of essentialized categories of racial difference. Literature coming from these intersections had been produced, they were just not being read that way at all times. They were to natural forms of creolization that would extend to other avenues of study, from the city or cityness to self-styling youth ethos at the turn of the millennium. These proposals calling for the recognition of the agility of culture in South Africa were contested, they were controversial and possibly even too ambitious for some. There were understandably still many apartheid memories to share, but newer stories and newer poems forged in the newer South Africa while that lasted were already arriving. While apartheid memoirs, autobiographies, and apartheid set fiction continue to proliferate, and this is nothing to complain about, obviously, new authors emerge writing into the transformational formation focus areas. With increased attention on new authors and new stories, the public intellectual spaces Nuttall had called for also continued to open up well into the second decade of the new century. The times have indeed changed, but paradoxically, on some level, we could also be back where we started this 21st century with identity politics which we see more of universally on a number of platforms. Here though, as an excited reader, I interject that I read hope. The identity politicians in literary practice are possibly transformed into something else. They are the non-performing audiences laughing from the inside of the performers they are intimate with. One can do as one pleases in literature, allegedly. Yes, your viewpoint may still be privileged, but soon you will find that your literary text is most likely boring with just you in it you and a sense of identity you may feel strong you belong to or that you repudiate. It's no longer so easily just your story as it may be on other platforms. Your story obviously is a little dull without intimacy, without closeness you probably could not avoid, most likely your family if you were born to one and are reasonably happy with your family. More and more new writings by new authors I find are about the self, yes, but not necessarily politically configured. In fact, more apolitical because of the personal, because the personal comes before the political and in the personal, people get fleshed out rather than the people of political discourse. For some or other reason, I detect mostly a boom in memoirs or stylish tales of the self from younger writers navigating the millennial born free moment, and also poetry, which is always a safe bet in South African literature. South Africa remains a country that favors stories of inspiration, of motivation and endurance. Much of this is epitomized by the kind of works being published now, works that are situated very much in the here and now rather than in the apartheid era. On public platforms, especially to university and school students, the message conveyed is usually one that encourages the pursuit of dreams. Young readers thus encounter many of their own identifiable narratives in the text they consume, and perhaps soon some of them may do the same. There's plenty of information out there. I don't know if Bonang Mateba's much enjoyed Bonang from A to B from 27, 2017 counts as information or misinformation, but the point is that it's there. That was a book that claims to come out with a lot of errors. Um, didn't really, she didn't really cover herself in glory with that, but it gave us a great moment. We came together as a community to laugh with her, not at her. Um, if, I stay, if I Stay Right Here by Chwati Nanglana is a riveting first novel about queer black female sexuality claimed by its author to be mostly autobiographical. Comedian Tumi Moraki released the autobiography and then Mama Said, words that set my life alight in 2018. The story, in effect, being a tribute to a mother, not unlike Trevor Noah's 2016 memoir, Born a Crime, already a fixture in some people's homes and possibly school syllabus. Haji Muhammad Darby's Sorry, Not Sorry from 2018 similarly privileges family and the self. However, these books, with the exception of Nanglanas, invariably have to deal with the topics of race and politics. I suppose my strongest feeling is that many of these above-mentioned texts do a lot of telling, but the poetry that catches my eye does a lot of showing. Telling and showing occurred to me even when I witnessed live performance poetry. At times, and I understand why, claps and clicks are for the telling because some words are still quite weighty. And there are relevant factors such as accessibility and approaches to consider. So I can't just make blanket statements here. In this paper, the three poets I look at seldom name check race or class or rush to describe a moment or singularity. 
It's all there, but we as readers may choose to look those ways or not. Rather, in the African humanist understanding, these poets speak firstly with the tribe, their most intimate relations. And they do not pretend that these stand in for the nation or for the province or for the city or for something else. In the case of Sydney's collection, a, a challenging and invigorating structure and style pervade what is at heart a story about a family. There are many social political inf inferences we could draw, but the text never emphasizes anything above the tale or tales of the family. In the work of Habiba, family and the memories of the family help the negotiation of distance, of being a citizen of two countries. Finally, in the snug locale of Kenya Adams's collection, the world is reflected through relationships, and the relationships are firstly familiar. Now, of course, there, as most of you know, this collection, uh, Collective Amnesia by Collective Tomb, it's dynamic. I will talk about it a little bit. And then there are, there are texts we just, we just follow and we read because we, in a way we have to. Um, these are some of the books I will pass around again, just to give you an idea also what I've been reading and the way some people are writing their lives. And because I'm making a comparison to what I'm finding in the poetry, I'm still not slating those books. Those are great books. Um, and they, they, I think they're essential reading, but I need to find what the poetry is doing that's different because we're also very quick to read the autobiography in poetry, not that we should do that. So let me just uh, pick up on Loud and Yellow Laughter, uh, Cindy's prize winning collection. Uh, she is the 2018 winner of the Ingrid Jonker Prize for Poetry for her debut collection, Loud and Yellow Laughter. It was first published in 2016 and originated as Cindy's master's thesis in creative writing at KZN under the supervision of Kobus Mulman. <coughs> Currently, Cindy is doing a PhD in English with us at Stellenbosch. She has been named by my colleague Anel Peters as among two of the most important young voices in South Africa at the moment, alongside Kuleka Futuma, whose debut collection, Kuleka Amnesia, became a bestseller in 2017. Cindy was born in 1990 in Durban. In rough summary, Loud and Yellow is a mixture of poetry and prose, as well as archival ephemera, more boldly, is structured into a stage play format that for all its arresting accoutrements and props, is a poetry play to me about three people named the daughter or the girl child. Um, and photos tell us who these people are, um, uh, the mother and, and the father. There are some minor characters, but these are three major characters. It's such a compelling but also provocative and very complex narrative structure. Uh, I think it's almost natural to feel somewhat overwhelmed when you start, but you persist because the writing just pulls you in and you trace this family, and you start finding out what the story is, but it's told, it's told in an incredibly kind of cut-up narrative way. It, it reminds one of French novel about filmmaking, which is something I'm actually going to get to here. Now, once read through, this playful poetry appears to present the daughter's tracing of her parents' lives leading up to her birth and further influencing her adolescence. I say appears and make no commitment you know, to a definitive reading because, firstly, poetry seldom neatly gels with notions of conventional storytelling, given the emotional and or intellectual impact of the lyric form, and also of verses, you know, the impact verses have on us, on, on readers and on listeners. Secondly, there's the reality of life's complexities. You know, nonlinearity isn't a thing in life. It's evoked by, by layers, and certainly this collection has layers of voices, of perspective, of memory, subjectivity, and of course, timeline. Conventionally, I think, many poems are bags of tricks to convey moods and moral universes. Sydney's poems are themselves the tricks in the bag, and one may even wonder if they are all poems in the strict understanding of the term, given the varied materials in their construction. Time and space shift in the collection. The daughter is born in 1990, while her mother enters the time frame in 1988, married to her biological father, who only plays a minor role in the play. An Englishman who fought in World War II is the daughter's adopted father, and his backstory makes up the historical sweep of the collection. In fact, the collection begins with his story as a boy in the 1930s and quickly moves into his war experience, quite viscerally presented, visually presented. From what we can tell, the daughter is mostly piecing together the puzzle of the man she grew up with as a father. Theirs is the more prominent stage time, if you will, although the mother is both very visible as well as very mysterious, not neatly fitting into any type. Loud and Yellow Laughter presents a complex family narrative that roughly stretches over 80 years. It is a complex narrative because the collection invites or dares readers to piece together the, the story, if you will, or what we may deduce is the story, and perhaps to do so along with one of the important characters introduced to us, if we accept the collection of poems as stitched into a whole. I say piece together because the components we need are presented to us in fragments, some with obvious but still uncertain connections, and some with 
overt disunity. But then that suggestion is vital as it is meant to be disruptive, according to my colleague Anel Peterson. More so, poetic convention is itself startled by the rapid changes and experiments with forms the poems exhibit. We may not be surprised by experimental poetry, but we may certainly take note of a number of experiments in one collection that succeed in mirroring the actual story or stories told. Stories that could only have been conveyed, we realize, because of the edgy, restless form of the collection itself. Characters are presented with their own backstories. Narrative is supplemented by photographs, letters, and interviews, purportedly with autobiographical roots, but this we may question as well. Presented as a stage play with characters and scene settings, the visual allure of many of the poems suggests a film plot to me, one that employs flashbacks and cross-cutting, deliberately applying scissors as if to play a game of cut, rearrange, and splice. In doing so, not only are the characters prioritized to the point where the reader is invited to spot the strong connection between the two of the three main characters. Now, a pivotal ev event, for instance, would be the revelation of how the daughter came to have a white English father, not a biological father. This is presented as something of a written confession, a letter, a prose poem, and it's titled, A Fragment from Mother. This is what I read out to you. I gave you to him because he could give you all the things I couldn't. He could teach you things I've never even heard of. He could teach you how to listen and enjoy his jazz music. He could teach you about history and all his wars, how to eat gracefully with a knife and fork. He could teach you to speak English, not my kind of English, his English. I knew that if you had that kind of clean, clear English, you would do better than me. Good English opens doors. People take you seriously when you speak, the way you speak. They listen to you, to the clarity of your English. They are impressed by it and they pay attention to it. That's all I ever wanted for you. I don't think I could have given it to you. That's why I gave you to him. And now Peterson comments that this prose poem sheds light on a transaction whereby the daughter gains English but loses a maternal connection to a mother and a mother's culture. And this particular fragment also falls under Peterson's significant reading of the possibility of decolonial critique um, Cindy may be offering by looking at the mother's acceptance of the twin power sites of patriarchy and language, which, in the context of the times, represent a forced idea of betterment for the daughter if she's placed within these structures. Taken solely on its own terms, the mother, of course, makes a decision, at least as far as language is concerned, that many other parents had made when or if presented with the means to do so. I sit here today exactly because of the same decision made by my mother in 1988. I was born and raised Afrikaans, and there were no English schools where I, where I grew up, but she found an English school to put me in. Consequently, I have a career as an English academic. I don't think that's a coincidence. In Cindy's dramatic poetry collection, it is dramatic that a black mother gives her daughter to a white Englishman, even if he is a kindly one, and levels her reasoning to the importance of language. The feeling of necessity behind the reasoning is not unfamiliar to many South Africans with a similar story behind the acquisition of English or indeed Afrikaans. The mother says that English would open doors for the daughter, but we also do not forget the fact that students risked their lives in 1976 to pres preserve their English education, which was all they could claim in the face of Afrikaner legislation. The mother gives a newborn a way to give her survival, or in her view, in fact, better life as it was framed under the prevailing social conditions. The father is revealed to be the more present, nurturing parent in a portion of the daughter's life, lending the collection an infinity to poems about fathers in the works of the other two poets, Habiba and, and Kenya. It is the father's story the daughter is most involved in piecing together to me, although her mother is still quite present in, in, in life and signals further opportunity for closeness and solidarity. In, in, in Anal Peterson's paper, she focuses on an interview that Cindy had with uh, our, our, our faculty's own um, uh, Lynn Rippenhart. And in this interview, uh, Cindy reveals that she aims to debunk notions of South Africanness or heterogeneity and, and to focus on different forms of South Africanness. So there's a key term of difference. You know, we don't, we don't just necessarily claim one big umbrella identity. Uh, whatever is South African is still far from being unpacked. It's why think as South Africans we argue the way we do. Um, so there's an alternative family structure that she looks at and in that sense to, to, to my colleague and our Peterson, Cindy's work becomes a play of enunciations of, of the living and the breathing and, and the articulating of finding what 
I think I am first before I'm trying to attach myself to, to anything greater than that. Now I want to move on because I took actually have to teach a class, so I'm going to move on to Habiba. Uh, read a few things, but then because if she were here, she'd have read her poem. So I hope you don't mind, but I've selected some poems and we'll just run through them. Probably not all of them, but we'll see how much we, we can do. So some of Habiba's poems are memory pieces of, of apartheid, and they are usually very much studies of her family and forms of intimacy, the things we had discussed earlier. If we do pause, however, and consider the apartheid and post-apartheid context in the work of a poet of dual citizenship who regularly offers views on home and away, then that context can be included to the cartography of Habiba South Africa or North America portraits, if only to show how the speaker emotionally shapes place. Space or place is not a flat surface in that sense because the social relations which create it are themselves dynamic by their very nature. It is a question of a manner of thinking. It is not the slice through time which should be dominant, which should be the dominant thought, but the simultaneous coexistence of social relations that cannot be conceptualized as other than dynamic. More than again as a result of the fact that it is conceptualized as created out of social relations, space is by its very nature full of power and symbolism, a complex web of relations of domination and subordination, of solidarity and cooperation. Much of Habiba's early work is involved with space, so much so that her second collection, A Hundred Silences, or is it her third, evokes motifs of breathing, silence, and photography. The poems, often referencing cameras and film, couldn't be more like snapshots to create a sense of space. An early collection, The Dream in the Next Body, seemed to offer poems that spoke to the theme of relocation and adjustment. A number of poems appeared to describe the speaker's anxiety around settling into a new country, whereas A Hundred Silences is made up almost exclusively of either memory pieces of South Africa or contemporary pieces set in South Africa. So moving on to that. The most recent collection, The History of Intimacy, brings together many of the themes and motifs of the other two collections discussed here, and also furthers the narrative of certain characters we'd met earlier, or at least we think we have. The poetry, it seems, moves at will, celebrating rather than lamenting to distant places. Uh, and this following is a quote from, from another former colleague of ours, Professor Rita Barnard. Knowing one's place is a socio-spatial dialect, expressed economically. The ambiguities of this cliché, referring both to one's standing um, and one's geographical situation, express the oppressive conflation of the spatial and the political. Yet the idea of knowing one's place, as a geographer John Weston has argued, contains a liberatory promise. Its witting, um, it wit its witting ambiguity also implies that there is some pregnant meshing of the two meanings, and that from this meaning can arise a third meaning. To know one's place can simply imply appreciation of its possibilities, to know its potential creativity for social action. In the dream in the next body, a place of memory so clearly evoked in one poem that for the descriptions of plants indigenous to the area in, in which the poem is set, a glossary is provided, something that uh, occurs in, in the other collections as well. The glossary suggests the speaker is reconstructing from afar, but also speaks to the power of memory to preserve a metaphysic barrier against the mechanisms of apartheid. The other language the speaker's tongue wishes to speak in is there for the reader. Um, should have actually have, uh, related with the title of that poem, but we will find it on these slides. This powerful and symbolic space woven from relations of domination and subordination, solidarity and cooperation, a space that lurks behind the static national demarcations of apartheid is none other than the space captured textually, um, obviously enough. Now, I might have to uh, go through some of these slides very quickly and I'll, I'll pause on some that I feel we could definitely engage with. And this is where I do begin to open this up to the floor because I can't necessarily direct you on my reading of Habiba's work. It might mean something to me, and as poetry should mean something completely different to you. I choose to infer this as one of the early poems in this 2005 prize-winning collection of somebody who feels dislocated, of somebody who is away, of a speaker who is away. And in this call to, to the speaker's mother, there is that sense of, of longing. Um, this is the first part of that poem. I'll just move on to the next. It's just this, this last part that really gets me. She speaks to, in a way, flattened by what is not said, coming only so close to the parting between us by telling me to leave safely. 
I don't know how many of you can relate, but that is my mother through and through. <laughs> um, this, this sounds familiar to me. And I don't say that this is you know, a finished analysis of itself. I'm actually looking at similar themes over these three collections. So I have to move a bit faster. This, to me, I, I'm reading uh, a speaker detailing an arrival. We find in Khabib a poet who just leaves you with a, la with a haunting last line in, in most of her works. I cannot myself be a question. Here to me is something rather overt. I'm the writer of food. Experiencing this work, I'm now getting something of a portrait of place and space and the feelings of place and space. Whether I might think these, these speakers are, are disunified. Now, of course, and really, some of us might know some of Khabib's narratives, and we can do that thing of this is clearly about so and so and so and so, but that's really not what we gather around when we discuss these works. You just work with the words that, that you have. And clearly to me, this seems to be addressed to a partner, uh, a speaker and a speaker's partner. And I, I'm still, in my, in my mind, seeing that this is part of an arrival. This is part of a settling. This is part of an adjustment. And bear in mind, this is the first of the three collections uh, I look at. So you'll forgive me for if I just move on. This is the, the poem that was referenced earlier where Khabib actually provides you with uh, the glossary, and I actually meant to include the glossary in the slide, and then I forgot. Um, <laughs> she's, it's, I'm, 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 I'm a buffoon, so I'm inclined to immediately read the, the Proustian part of this. I'm immediately inclined to see this is just that moment, uh, the evocative moment of, of, of childhood, etc. And, and we have garden imagery that transports us. It's, it's me also projecting. It's me also wishing, both because there's always such, been such a clear formula for this kind of thing. But this, this goes on. I'll pick it up from, from the last part here. Early in the day, shadows wash over old tiles stacked against the cement wall. In the cold and silence, my brother is making a garden. There will be many references to gardens in, in our other works. The makers of gardens, the makers of space, the makers of country. In, in, I, I, wrote, I wrote my PhD on, on a South African poet, an Afrikaans poet named Louis Leitbold, who was very much concerned about uh, the kind of horticultural uh, of imperative of, of, of land building and cultivation and husbandry, as the term was at the time, as being very much similar to nation building. So, you know, one's inclinations come, come into this. But I left this here because it leaves us with a portrait of a male character. And this starts coming through. The, the poems are very much interconnected. Not all of them, but one starts spotting similar turns of phrase, similar words, similar images and symbols that, that Khabibah uses and, and lets her speakers run with. With 100 silences, the poems are so short, and there are so many more of them, about 72, I think. And there is, across all the poems, or most of them, this fascination of the cameras and photography. And this much I will probably will interject. I know that Khabibah is famously anti-digital. I mean, she'll use computers and emails and all that, but she really doesn't like smartphones and things like that. Chances are she probably still uses an old camera. I'm really not supposed to reach out like that, but I couldn't resist seeing the snapshots. And obviously I know some other backstory there, but we're getting closer to, to, to frozen memory. We are looking at still pictures now. We're not yet actually in motion. There's just so many stills uh, to consider. And I think we're past that period of adjustment that we found in the first collection, and now we have a look back. To me, I'm sensing a lot of looking back to the home that was left. And yeah, I started cutting some poems, but this one I will ask you to process. This is the second half of a poem called Fit, which describes a father who is a tailor.
here to me we're getting warmer to a theme that I mentioned earlier of, of, of showing and not always telling which we, we trust good poetry to do but poetry doesn't always have to play by those rules and I find the process quite so this, that, this, this is an actual poem this is a snapshot poem the, the economy if you will I did start choosing shorter poems I was aware that time was still running out This one I included because there were so many concentrated poems on the father figure. And I might, this I might share, the, the last two occasions uh, I was in an audience in which Habiba discussed her work. She did actually offer these as, as introductions. She did speak about her parents, etc. Um, so there I thought I would, I would add that as, as something of a footnote. So this deals with loss. And so far we've been dealing with, with poets will have the positive memory of the father. I'm not saying the father should be negative, but we're finding, you know, a link in that. Any other reference to someone holding a camera? I find there's some experimentation with the gaze, of always looking, but of also of looking back, looking back at a, at a place one has left, but also um, the object of the gaze, looking back. We we might have some familiarity with the gaze and notions of the gaze. So now we... Did I skip something here? No, I did. There is something I thought I'd written here that clearly something there's a mistake, but this is from the history of intimacy. Again, this is just a portion of a much longer poem. The poems are now longer in this 2018 collection. And there was a bit of a gap in Habiba's poetry work. Um, and one of the reasons for the gap would be the amazing regarding Muslims book that, that you saw earlier. The poems are now longer. I find they have just a bit more to say, less snapshots. Uh, there's some outright social commentary in them, some. A lot of motion. There's now movement. Instead of still pictures now, I sense in the history of intimacy, movement. There's movement of time, movement of people. People are ever doing things. There's one poem in which a colleague I thought might have been here is actually mentioned by name. Um, and, and she and the speaker are swimming. There's always something in movement, in motion. Even when somebody um, is ill or is, you know, having that moment in which, you know, that's considered immortality, there's always something in motion. That is definitely something technical one spots in, in the poem. But then you have these little inserts where one hadn't found such overt kind of passages or overt lines. This is from a longer piece, but it speaks to, to love and, and to desire, really, across racial boundaries and the processing thereof. So there are some surprises. There's a sense of, I wouldn't say a more experienced uh, poet overall, but there's definitely more, more things being put out there for us to, to digest. This is actually another part of, of that previous poem. I see now I always wanted what was furthest from me, a boundary I conjured into flesh that disappeared beneath my fingers. I never resolved the mess of it, the way want is desire and lack at the same time. Very Deridian, isn't it? Desire is always unattainable. You can't, you know, once you've attained the thing, you've defeated the purpose of desire. And there are also some very specific titles. You know, imagery of, of a nurse in an ambulance indicates that the husband mentioned here has a medical emergency. And I do recall the last time Habiba was actually uh, taking us through her poems. This was also prefaced by something rooted in, in, in real life. And this is a reference to the Cape Flats. I 
think they might only do one more clip of film after this. I do apologize that I'm making you read it so quickly, but uh, I, I, as far as I know, the bookstores do have her work, so hopefully this is a good plug um, for her. I will leave it as far as the Khabibah focus goes on, on this because we've heard some about a father, but a mother, an autobiography of the mother is still alive. Doctor, by the way. To this day, she recalls with anger gave her how he saved her sister's life. Anger, breath. Since the beginning, you have been breath in poetry. Those endings, I think as a writer, you just wish you could hit those zones. Uh, Shay, could you tell me what the time is, please? It's about 40 minutes. Okay, I don't want to neglect it's Kenya. Yeah. Um, Nadi, could I ask you to read a selection from Kenya? Is, is the Kenyan book doing the rounds? I would like my colleague Nadi just to read something from that book, please. Okay. I've been given a job. Just for some context, Nadia presented in our uh, departmental seminar a week ago in English on writing men, um, and there were a lot of references to her father in there. And now I'm asking her to read two poems by this 20-year-old poet. The first is called The First Boy, and the second poem is called Chester, and Chester is the speaker's father. Okay, well, I've never read these poems before, so I'll give you a little bit of this. All right, I, 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 I left you from you. the hard stuff. Um, the First Boy. My first kiss, our lips, a complete mess. I did it wrong. As soon as it was over, I galloped away, full of giddy, feeling awkward but hopeful. My first proper boyfriend, we lasted eight months, gap in between, another two months, and in the end, no more months. I thought it was for real. I thought it was love. You know, that get married and have kids love, I was so sure. But what did I know? Only 13 with so much to learn from the big bad world. My mother banned me from having any contact with the boy, which only resulted in me wanting to see him so much more. I laugh to myself now when I think of how much I cried. In my room for hours, sad little girl, still grasping the blurred line between love and lust. The similarities will swindle you like a crook. Seven years later, I still wonder how he is. I think about him from time to time. I hear our song and I miss being 13. I hope he has a lover, just as I do. I hope he's happy, just as I am. That's beautiful. <laughs> Chester, moving along. Chit chat, heart to heart, everything in the open. Here we sit. You sit on the wooden stump, smoking a Marlboro, original, of course. A typical evening ritual. I ask questions, you answer them, revealing a few secrets. Your coffee's getting cold. I remind you, we both smile. Everything is so pure and the words flow out of me effortlessly. If only my conversation was this simple, this warm. We listen to the cars that drive by, the soft whispers of a stranger who passed, the flicker of the stars above, keep us at ease as we continue to sit here. So some context for Kenya, uh, they, it, it, it's probably cheating, but I do know that most of the poems here are about Paul. I've lived there my whole life, it could only be about Paul. I know exactly what there isn't to write about Paul, and somehow this poet has found things to write about Paul. It's a place that as a youngster in my time, you just have, you wanted to escape, you wanted to get away from. Um, there's no, similar, and, and somebody who had no idea who Cindy is, who, who Habiba is, um, when, when I briefly chatted with, with Kenya, she was just read on her own mission as a poet. So I find the fact that there are some intersections with the work of these two other poets we've been discussing, um, also a slim collection and just an awareness of how she wants to use her rhythm as a musician, I can't help but admire that. Um, there's no outright you know, identity claiming here. That's what I find, and I, I'm going to sound ageist, but I find that somewhat astonishing from a 20-year-old writer. Um, there's, there's so much fortification around the family and not just, you know, the, the hive of the family and moving on from there. There's only one 
what you might call awareness, and it's so positive. There's a section in here. I'll read out the, the names of the, of the sections of, of this collection for you. And I'll also read the letter from the author out to you. Uh, the sections are birth, death, rebirth, and the last one, especially for the femmes. A um, lot of awareness, a lot of body positivity. Um, I'm, I'm going to say, I don't think that my generation at 20 uh, was clueless. Not work. It's, a lot of vocabulary has changed, a lot of awareness has changed. Uh, we were at the dawn of the internet. Uh, I'm not saying you know we, we have less than, than, than some from this generation, but I read hope in this, if I may be schmaltzy and sentimental about that. I'll just read the letter from the author and I'll wrap up. Rebirth is my gift to you. Many moments throughout my 20 years on this planet and a few, and few good enough to write about. This is a reflection of my journey and perhaps a sneak peek into the future. Many nights crying, tears dripping into these pages, many moments on the train jotting down my thoughts, mixing gin with anger equals girl power bones. These stories are quite personal and intimate, and in saying that, I hope they inspire you, bring you a little bit of discomfort, and remind you that your existence is valid. I hope this book reminds you of the importance of friends, of moments we take for granted. I specifically created a femme section for girls and a few poems featured are an attempt to normalize the female body and blur the icky stigma that comes along with being a woman. I've learned many lessons in these 20 years and I know there are hundreds more waiting for me. But with lessons come pain and with pain comes experience. Experience that may encourage you to do some good in the world. Like write a book, for instance. So here, yeah, enjoy. Flip the pages. Feel with me. And you know, on, on one level, that, that's one kind of introduction. And then you get to the collection and you, and you find that there's some tongue-in-cheek there, uh, which I, I couldn't see, not being on the inside of, of some of these pages and some of these words. But it's all there, including when the, the poetry starts getting to the body and just starts breaking down the booze, which I even have to tell you, in a place like Balls still very much exist. So there is... I couldn't get to her in the formal aspect of this. I just need to share this with you. But there's also work on space and how one is within space in, in this. But I'll leave it there for now. Thank you for listening. Okay, I've got a few things to say. Thank you. If you don't mind, Leon. Is the um, other, sorry, is the other issue of intimacy still doing around? Because that's actually uh, got someone's name on it that it has to be returned to. <laughs> okay. No? Yeah. Oh, thank you. The yellow one? Uh, yeah, the yellow Habiba one. I might be killed if I don't bring that, that back. Oh, that's Cindy's one. Oh, maybe I made a mistake. I hope so. <laughs> I don't know if I brought both. Uh, I brought I two. One was actually it. meant for you to read. Is it? Do you have my um, book? No, I don't have it. <laughs> Anybody? Uh, then we have uh, the history of intimacy. Have you read book? It books don't run in your own. Okay. So anyway, it's fine. I, I might also you might be completely lost. Water. So. No, no, it's all good. No, it's fine. I, I think okay. I'm getting my wires crossed here. Don't worry about it. <laughs> okay, I suppose one way... Do you have to leave, Ian? What's the time? Two. I'll Two. push it to five minutes. Okay. I suppose one way to think about what Leanne's been talking about, you know, when he talks about poetry and specific poets and the specific works of these poets, one of the questions that came to mind for me was how to read this history of intimacy alongside anthropological study. And so I'm thinking about how or what do these imaginings of the family, which you've mentioned in some of the works of Habiba and David's, um, as well as um, Cindy Swa's mm. work, what do these imaginings of the family tell us about hegemonic representations of race, of gender, of sexuality? What does it tell us about the social and the political? And is it the job of poetry to do that? And I don't think that's what you're saying, but I think it's a question that, that, we, that we do need to consider, that literature beyond poetry, um, what literature offers us in terms of thinking about the social and the political? And I, I believe that the job of anthropologists to some degree, and you know your job better than I do, but is partially about understanding how human beings work. It's a, and I think that in some ways that's also what, um, what writers do. They want to understand how human beings work. So I'm interested in how your analysis of what these poets do about, in terms of writing about the self, 
um, how writing about the self is useful for us. I mean, why should we care if somebody writes about the self? How does it matter? How is that useful for anthropology? So I don't have the answers because I'm busy thinking about this myself, but it is something I suppose that we need to be giving, we need to put some insight into. Um, does it matter? I think it does. Mm. Yeah. I mean, so, so for me, the, the very question of does one have a self? Is mm. the self a mm. single coherent entity? Or to a self is, is surely, as the poets suggest, through the kinds of language and the troping and the style they use, it's always mediated, always inflected, and it's always, it may pause and congeal, mm. but then it becomes processual. So I think that the questions of self are crucial. And to think of how Abati would, how selves were denied. Mm -hmm. People were not considered to, to be human beings. So you deny the self. You know, so writing ways into different kinds of selfhood. I mean, if I think of um, the very title of Fabella's last, most recent collection, History of Intimacy. I, can, I always look at that and I see the birds on the cover and my brain also does a flip. It goes, the intimacy of history. So it's the history of intimacy, but the intimacy of history, it's writing history precisely through the lineations of particular families and their, their movements, their shifts, and so on. So, yeah, I mean, I think also like Stephen Klingman's work on Nadine Gordimer, that book has got um, history from the inside. That's potentially what uh, what literature can offer us. Mm. And there's increasingly such a blurring in a way between the anthropological, the ethnographic, the auto-ethnographic, which is not to say they don't remain distinct disciplines, but that we are increasingly borrowing from. But you must do. Yes, I mean, it's just invigorating. But how do we, how do we, mm. how do we think about what constitutes being a human being mm. in the world we need to look beyond the policing of the genres. Um, mm -hmm. But how do we answer these questions about being a human being? We have to look at different um, disciplines. Also, just I was thinking about how the how. Um, so I have to cut in. I, I, I have to apologize for being so rude. But I do have a class waiting now, and it's really my own fault because I've rambled on. Um, and with my boss sitting right there, I really can't be late now. Can I? <laughs> um, I do have, I have to collect my books from you, but I do have presents, bookmarks from the English department. Yeah. Like them. So, uh, okay, thanks so much, Julian, yeah, for opening the conversation for us. I know yeah. we already from the, from, from the uh, contributions, you gave yeah. us enough just to think. So I well, think thank that you for having me, and thank you for, yeah, for, for so listening. Much. Really do appreciate it. Uh, that was entirely experimental, and um, I'm grateful that you allowed me to try that. Thank you, Amber. But I wonder if this is an opportunity also for other people, right, to, to come in to what study is. Uh, yeah. I'll leave uh, Nadia as a representative. Is, Thank you. Uh, not a normal. Bye, yeah. yeah, thanks a bit. Um, maybe the physical format of this is too much like a lecture. <laughs> ideally, it's going to be different. But I think, yeah, they've opened up a lot of ideas. Sorry, I don't want to interrupt you. But I also want to invite anybody else yes. who wants to comment on this. Come forward with ideas that maybe you, yeah. So oh, I, well, I, I was it. talking about the gaps that um, literature also falls in terms of undermining or troubling, you know, um, dominant um, constructions of human beings, um, which you have to rely on in in the social sciences to a huge degree in order for the social sciences to matter. And I'm not against the social sciences, I love, I love the social sciences. Mm -hmm. I love the teachers. I love the social Yes. <laughs> so, um, and because that's my background, actually. So, mm -hmm. I'm thinking about um, how literature, like, you know, poetry, like Kwabi Bais and Sally, sorry that we're picking on you, but you did come. And, <laughs> <laughs> and I see you and then I think, oh, um, but I'm thinking about how um, we are offered insight into a single person.
that um, social science theories often cannot do. And, and that's why I think it's in, so important for, for um, literary cultural studies to work alongside the social sciences in order to think about um, how we operate as humans. I'm kind of just talking off the top of my head here based on Dion's talk. So. Yeah, if I can just add something. Just yes, no. As a, as a point of view. What I find quite striking is that the poet, poets always writing from a particular location. I think as Rian mm -hmm. mentioned, right? It's very, it's always material, it's embodied, it has all these kind of, um, and at least in anthropology, it has been a huge turn to this, right? To thinking about embodied rationality, so how we actually live with our body in the material space. We don't idea that ideologies are not that influential. I mean, they, uh, uh, not, 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 not that influential, but they kind of circulate, and the, and the complexity of everyday life happens in locations which, um, which both sometimes confirms these broader kind of, you know, discursive and structures of power, but also confounds them. Mm. And the question, um, well, at least that's what struck me here, was that um, by looking, talking about, as you suggested, right, the, um, what did you call it, Eternal Habiba, the, the in intimacy as history. Intimacy as history is quite a, um, a fruitful, fruitful way, because we, in, in, we, we stuck with these binaries, right? Mm. History versus oral narrative, mm. different cultures, different civilizations. These are obviously long been um, discredited, but, but somehow seem to reappear right, in very subtle ways in the way that things get theorized, where a poet kind of just leaves all of that behind to actually tell it to you, you know, to actually give the history of intimacy. Or the in wait. <laughs> Whatever, because at least that's what I got again. Well, you confound it, and that's right. <laughs> okay. In some ways, I mean, you are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's that's part of the uncertainty. I think of so. The poet not just telling you something, mm -hmm. but making a space for the possibilities of materializing and rematerializing, mm -hmm. which is showing and telling. So, mm -hmm. where the language itself. What was that line from Kabir? Something about. Um, we want. Want is both desire and lack. And lack. Mm -hmm. So to want okay. something, you mm -hmm. want it, but you left wanting. So it's never completely fulfilled. It's, it's yeah, it moves yeah. towards closure, but it's open. Okay, yeah. And may, may I just come in? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm an old sociologist in the department. When I returned, when I returned to Stellenbosch 20 years ago, I renewed the friendship with a professor of English, whose name is McKill Hayes. He then retired, or left, and he started writing novels, and after his first well-known novel, I went to him and I said to him, I congratulate you on your novel, and I feel a bit jealous. <laughs> he said to me, look, Simon, my friend, all anthropologists and all sociologists are deep down frustrated novelists, <laughs> <laughs> and even more deeply, they are frustrated poets. <laughs> But to be able to become a novelist or a poet, you need, in the first place, to love the language, not the meaning you're going to communicate. You need to love the language. So my question is, um, what do you think of what Mathiel Hayes said? And are there, are there poets and novelists who are frustrated anthropologists <laughs> and sociologists? What do you think? <laughs> Perhaps, yes. I don't know. I think you need talent to write. And I don't think all anthropologists have talent. <laughs> well, no, I don't. I think you need a certain kind of talent to write a novel. And I think you need talent to write poems. Because they are not just taken out of your head one day. And there, there is a structure to creativity. There must be. But is it a what? <laughs> it's provocative. And it's my point of view. I could be wrong. So. Yeah. You just saw that one too. Yeah. Police yeah. discipline you about. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not saying people shouldn't try. Yeah, yeah. 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 So here's Steve sitting here. Mm. I mean, Steve has a few books. Well, it's, it's a fantastic book. Uh, yeah, that's it. The Letters of Stone <laughs> is the most, yeah. it's the most incredible book mm. by a, what was it, social anthropologist? I don't know how you classify yourself. Um, no. And uh, I mean, it's a, it, it is a book which, which tells the most wonderful
wonderful stories about a family, other families across cultures, across continents, and Greece stories for me linked to Stellenbosch and, and other ones. So, I mean, I don't know if you feel you're sort of an illustrated novelist, or you just, <laughs> in some level, we are people who are very interested in the capacity of history as story, story as history, the power of, of image and symbol to create something that's quite resonant, and then perhaps that's, that symbolism also needs to be deconstructed and broken apart, and you reach the more intimate and the more elusive. Um, yeah, your book is it's a wonderful feat of historical and intimate storytelling. Yeah, I have to <laughs> I mean, what is interesting, I always have to step out of the conventional way of writing as a social scientist by doing a course, an MA in creative writing. You just be in the space of poets and writers. I'm not a novelist or a poet, and I, I never tried to become one. But just in that space, you know, things started uh, becoming clear that you could write differently, and I had to be. I was working with were quiet. Mm. It couldn't be all about uh, tally because mm. these letters that were argued were so affectively charged. So by just over interpreting, and this is my final comment is at one of my book launches, Mark Devissa was there, and he was saying, had he had those letters, he would have been tempted to go even further on the literary path. Or the imaginative part, but as a kind of an anthropologist, I was drawn back to a kind of more restrained way of interpreting. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this is the final point. I wrote one chapter as fiction, um, and then reworked it as non fiction. That's again the spreading different genre. Mm -hmm. But, and Required quite a break from conventional disciplinary modes of life. Fascinating. I wonder if this speaks to the question of next style, right? Because disciplines, of course, have conventions mm -hmm. and certain. Um, yeah, maybe maybe we need you <laughs> to tell us about the, about the writing process. So it's quite fascinating, right? That you have to leave certain preconceived I mean, ways in which you represent. I mean, that's actually what we do. We always, in the part of a discursive tradition with previous anthropologists, we, um, but obviously I think as Leon and Jobless poets are also part of it in a different way. And so the question is how, I suppose, how do we learn from it? I mean, I, I, I can't help but advertise this book regarding Muslims, which I think is just a brilliant analysis. History, it's ethnographic, it's extremely theoretically sophisticated, it's uh, profound, many kinds of categorizations which um, the social sciences are sometimes over concerned with, either upholding or going against. So these are just a binary mode. And what it does is actually just cuts through. And part of the thing that literature, at least I suppose, do is also bring out individual actors. So it's not the anthropologist who goes out to make people speak or to find out what they're thinking. They're already doing something. And it's just a matter of looking at that archive and taking it out and reading it. Um, yeah. One minute. Yeah. Um, I, I think I think that um, I'm, I'm a well, teach sociology. I, I think that one of the things we 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 are quite bad at doing in sociology is, is to encourage students to put themselves in the picture when they're writing. And and um, and, and so I mean, what I found really. Well, one of the things I found very moving and interesting about, about the, the poems that, that were read out was the location of, of, of the, the poet that you, you point to, and, and uh, Rian's interpretation as well of, of, of um, how the, the poems change in relation to her own experiences. And I think that that's something that, that um, you know, we, we don't pay much attention to in, in social sciences kind of generally, but, but um, on, on this, the, the fear that, that um, you know, people are going to generalize on the basis of, the, of their own experiences. And this, this kind of almost paranoia around this, I think, is, is quite problematic in some ways. And, and I think one of the things it fails to do also is to 
engage with, with the kind of emotions people experience as well. You know, that, that, that often it leaves, um, I don't know, I, I find this in my own writing, you know, when I'm, um, a lot of the work I do, research I do is interview based and, and with kids in schools and, and students in universities, it's about their experiences. And, and, and sometimes, you know, the, the, the data is incredibly rich. And, and, and I think that, that um, you know, you know my way of analysing that data is, is you know, I mean, sometimes it's quite sensitive, but other times, you know, it's hitting it with a sledgehammer stick. And, 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 and so I, I think, I think those, those issues about how to write, you know, is, is really important, actually. Mm. And, and, and in ways which kind of do justice to some extent what's been said, the complexity of what's been said, the emotion which being conveyed. So, so, so maybe, I mean, what, what, what I'm saying, you know, I, I'm really in favour, you know, of not policing the academic division yeah. of labour. Let, let's see how we can break the academic division of mm. labour down, but by, by, by you know, working on, on projects, you know, with anthropology, sociology, and English literature. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and finally, whatever form our domain I'm sorry if I offended anyone earlier. No, 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 no. I think, <laughs> I think. Look, I don't think I'm talented either. That's not that I would say I wasn't like, oh, you know, I wasn't trying to defend English literature. Um, I don't defend it. I see its uses. I see anthropology's uses and so on. I see the uses of many different fields of study and in terms of what kind of knowledge it can produce. Um, yeah. I'm not changing what I said earlier. <laughs> <laughs> I'm merely saying study for our friends. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Thank you. Actually, I don't know, this wasn't the best way, I know, and Nadia was very adamant when she said, said, no, we must not have similar such a conversation. I'm glad that at least we got some kind of input. I had no idea how it would work. Maybe uh, we have to do more of this, actually, just to, um, yeah, to think through. Um, especially because, at the end of the day, what we read, I think that's, that's what I love about Rian, right? What you read is not, um, it's not definitive. The poet doesn't give you, actually, the read. And so, I often have this discussions with friends of mine who have poetry, you know, is it an absolute immediacy? Or someone like me who's interested in critical theory, when I have Habiba's history of intimacy, I can, I, I connect with a lot of discussions I've had with her about, uh, you know, uh, basically, you know, different kinds of philosophy, actually, which she is very much steeped in, you know, so whether it's a different kind of language philosophy, post-structuralism, whether it's materiality, all these kinds of mm -hmm. post post-colonial theories, everything is somehow floating around, right? And the question is then how they bring into that. So the fascinating thing is how we actually bring our, um, yeah, our disciplinary training, you know, to this, to these kind of productions and perhaps uh, with the potential to use them in creative ways. And, and it is happening, so it may be something we um, need to uh, develop more in South Africa. And we can because it's such a rich field, right, of, uh, of literary production. Um, okay, thanks so much for coming.